Let us now finally come to the announced section, exact relations in dimensional regularization and dimensional reduction. Essentially, all the statements that we made before in the path integral context remain valid in these two schemes uh, when we mean that the left-hand side and right-hand side of each equations are interpreted as Feynman diagrams. Feynman diagrams on the regularized level in D unequal to four where uh, we still have counter terms and divergencies, uh, but the divergencies might cancel between loop graphs and counter term graphs and so on and so forth. But on this level where everything is um, defined via Feynman diagrams in these schemes, all the equations are literally and exactly valid. That is the so-called regularized quantum action principle and it was established for dimensional regularization by Brighton, Dona, Meison in the same paper that we also discussed in the context of the convergence proof. They did it for dimensional regularization and uh, I did a similar proof in the context of dimensional reduction uh, in a paper in 2005. And the proofs are in principle the same. However, in that paper, the proof was given in the context of the alpha parametrization, as we discussed in the context of convergence. Here, I did a more a diagrammatic proof, and in the lecture today, I will give this diagrammatic proof um, from that paper. But in principle, both approaches would apply to both schemes. There is really no scheme difference. Let me tell you what the conditions are. Because the proof that follows depends on subtle details in those schemes which we have already discussed but uh, which will now become very relevant, namely, um, a fermion propagator, for example, is given in d dimensions as i times p slash minus, uh, sorry, plus m divided by p square minus m square, where now all the momenta are d dimensional. This is d dimensional, and this is d dimensional as well. Therefore, this is also in d dimensions the same as this. So it's the, uh, the propagator is the inverse of p slash minus m in d dimensions. And therefore, the propagator has a one-to-one -one correspondence to a free Lagrangian L3 in d dimensions, which uh, reads psi bar times i d slash in d dimensions minus m psi. Then the usual relationship between the free Lagrangian and the propagator is valid also in d dimensions. That is one requirement. And that would not be fulfilled, for example, if somebody had the idea to put here a four-dimensional p slash, whereas here a d-dimensional p slash, because then you cannot invert it, and it wouldn't have a correspondence to a d-dimensional Lagrangian. We want to obtain relationships between green functions and Lagrangians. Therefore, this is an important detail in the definition of dimensional regularization, which must also be true in dimensional reduction if we want to have this quantum action principle. Similarly, of course, we need mathematical consistency. Which means in this case that each initial expression should give rise to one unique final expression and in the context of dimensional reduction, this in particular means that uh, the four-dimensional space for vector fields is really um, a quasi four-dimensional but actually infinite dimensional space. Which means that index counting is not possible. <laughs> 
These are two details on the schemes which are uh, now assumed to be valid and which uh, must be valid in your actual calculations uh, if you want to make use of this regularized quantum action principle. Good. Now let us write down the exact statement. As I said, the statement is easily done, namely all equations of the previous section are literally valid if interpreted in dimensional regularization or dimensional reduction as identities between Feynman diagrams. in the unequal to four. And then in this context, what we called L full before is now the d-dimensional Lagrangian, which includes the free part, which has this property, plus interacting part, plus counter terms, which might have one over epsilon poles, plus source terms, uh, proportional to y for composite operators. All of this is contained now in what we call L full before, and uh, this is now a d-dimensional Lagrangian, or in dimensional reduction, a Lagrangian which contains d-dimensional objects and quasi four-dimensional objects. And some actual four-dimensional objects are also allowed, like for instance, gamma five. So, That means in our statements, uh, on the right-hand side, always this L full appeared, and this has now a very specific role. This is the, let's say, the bare Lagrangian. Yeah, let me highlight this. This is what would normally be called the bare Lagrangian of the theory, tree-level Lagrangian plus all the counter terms, including the epsilon dependence. And that is the object which appears in uh, the appropriate places of the path integral relationships. Let me write down in particular the most basic relationship, and this is the only one we are going to prove. All the other ones are then similar or corollaries, but let's just do the basic one this main quantum action principle, which was the more abstract relation. But um, in terms of green functions, it was also um, quite nice to see. And uh, let me give the version in terms of green functions. Zero is equal to uh, the expectation value of delta phi, uh, one x one, times phi 2 x2 two and so on up to phi n xn um, plus and so on phi 1 x1 up to delta phi n xn and then the remaining term was plus phi 1 x1 all without deltas, phi n xn. And now here we have the additional term, um, which is the insertion of i times variation of this s full derivative with respect to phi i times delta phi i integrated over this space-time argument here and then close the expectation value. And all of this in the presence of sources which are still arbitrary. 
that is our relationship. Let me just double check the eyes, not to make a mistake. Yes. Right. Now, uh, in order to prove it, we need to interpret everything here as a set of Feynman diagrams in perturbation theory, and the Feynman diagrams are evaluated on the regularized level using this spare d-dimensional Lagrangian, maybe including counterterms. So it would be including renormalization, but uh, still at d unequal to 4. So we are now going to give a proof of this particular relationship and all the other ones are then obvious or similar. Let us split the um, S full into two parts, namely a free part plus all the rest and let me call the rest capital interaction because this is now not only what we usually call the interaction uh, Lagrangian or action, but includes source terms for composite operators and counter terms and all these things. Uh, but anyway, there is an unambiguous three level free part which gives rise to the propagators in the Feynman rule. And everything else which is contained here gives rise to vertices, either normal vertices or counter term vertices or insertions of composite operators. But this split is unique, and this free part has the property that it defines the propagators um, uh, which are determined in the usual way, even in d dimensions. So S3 has the following general form. It's an action, so we have a space-time integral and then it contains bilinear expressions in all the fields. So let's just um, use a notation which is similar like for scalar fields, but in fact it could be valid also for spinor fields or vector fields. So this is the general free um, action, or that would be the free Lagrangian. It is bilinear in all the fields. And uh, this bilinear term might contain differential operators or mass terms or uh, similar objects. And it might have some normalization like one half. So the one half is now correct for real fields. And uh, in some sense, everything can be written in terms of real fields or Majorana spinors. And then you would always have this universal one half. So the K is a general uh, differential operator which is matrix valued in the space of the dynamical fields. And uh, our condition from above means that the free propagators are the inverse of this, uh, these differential operators. So the free propagators which we use in our Feynman diagrams in dimensional regularization, they would correspond to objects like this, phi, uh, let's say phi k, phi l, free green function, two-point function, uh, the value is um, i times d k l with some space-time arguments and indices in the space of all dynamical fields. And now uh, these propagators are always the inverse of the differential operators, which means that in momentum space 
we have um, k i j times Fourier transformation times b tilde j l summed over j is equal to i times Kronecker delta i l. That is what it means. And that corresponds to the statement at the top. So this is one condition, and this is one important ingredient in setting up a relationship between Feynman diagrams and the regularized Lagrangian. So this is one such relationship. Okay. And as I said, this would not always be true if uh, somebody changes the scheme in this weird way, then this would be wrong. But we assume it. Then we can write down our terms. We have, um, let's say, that is our expression, star. Then our expression, star, can now be written in terms of the following. So let's say sum over um, m from 1 to n. And then we would have here this phi 1 delta phi m without the arguments. So these are all the terms of the first kind. Plus the second kind of term. And now we split this into two terms. Namely, we have the free part. But let's begin with the interacting part. Interacting part, derivative. And the free part. So we have now three terms. Let's say we have term of kind one, terms of kind 2a, and terms of the kind 2b. So that was both the second kind of term, but it is now split into the interacting um, Lagrangian and the free Lagrangian. So and from both, we take a variation in view of this field transformation that we are studying. So the free part is probably not invariant, so that is um, not zero, and the interacting part is also not invariant, so that is also not zero. And the sum of the three terms must be zero. What we need to do is to write down the Feynman diagram expression for each of the three kinds of terms, and then we need to um, identify cancellations between the Feynman diagrams so that we get zero in the end. The most complicated of the three is this one, because here we need to apply this relationship from the propagators, and uh, then we will get some cancellations. So we need to write everything in terms of Feynman diagrams, but what does it mean to write something in terms of Feynman diagrams? We need formulas here to identify equalities, and uh, the Feynman diagrams are represented for us in the Gelman law formula. That really is the formula which defines Feynman diagrams also on the regularized level in d dimensions. Therefore, let's say this Feynman diagrams are related to the Gelman law formula. And uh, the Gelman law formula is then, of course, evaluated using Wick's theorem, which gives rise to Feynman graphs. So therefore, the Gelman law formula contains 
uh, for each of those green functions, let's say dot dot dot, green function in the presence of j and y is given in the Gelman law formula as a denominator, which is always the same, and the numerator is given by the free um, expectation value of the same string of operators, and then we have here an exponential of i times the action, and that is now really the same interaction action or interaction Lagrangian as we identified before. Namely, our theory is defined by a total action, which is a free part, giving rise to the free propagators and the rest. And the rest is exactly what appears in the Gelman law formula. So that is the Gelman law formula. And the denominator can be ignored because it's always the same. And then this presence of J and Y means that uh, in this um, exponent, all the sources and uh, even sources with J can be incorporated into what we call S int. No problem, because everything can be lumped together in one big Lagrangian or action. So that is what we have. And so now we need to evaluate all these three kinds of terms at the same order in the interaction, and then we can identify cancellations. So let's say evaluate everything at which order. at the order of the interaction Lagrangian to some power, let's say to the power capital N. Then we need to be careful because here there already is one factor of the interaction Lagrangian Therefore, here we need to evaluate the Gelman law exponential only to one order less. But here we need to evaluate the Gelman law exponential to this order and here as well. So this gives now rise to the following kinds of expressions. So one, um, at this order, s int to the power n. What is this? So let's take one single term. We have this free expectation value of uh, phi 1 dot 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 delta phi m dot 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 phi n. And then um, so many terms i 1 over n factorial from the exponential and then n such factors i s int, i s int, and these are precisely n factors. And this is to be evaluated using Wick's theorem by doing contractions between operators and doing everything in d dimensions. Okay, there is not much else we can do at this point. That's the expression for the uh, term one. Now the expression for term 2b, proportional to the same L s i int to the power like that. Then we have only one over n minus one factorial because the Gelman law exponential needs one order less. And then here we have this. And uh, let's say phi one up to phi n. Then this special factor, i times functional derivative with respect to phi i, delta phi i, and then n minus one such factors. n minus one factors. This is the literally um, literal definition of equation, why did I say 2b, it's 2a, um, at the same order. So this can be compared. 
then uh, there is also not much we can do here. Then 2b at the same order. is equal. So here we have no interaction Laplacian, therefore we need again order n. Then this expectation value phi 1 to phi n. Then the special factor i times uh, ds3 i d phi i d phi i and then again n factors so these are the three expressions corresponding directly to Feynman diagrams now uh, what can we do I said we cannot do much here we cannot do much here but hopefully we can do something there and why can we do something? Because we know something about the free Lagrangian. Namely, we know this propagate, uh, uh, property. Namely, the propagators are the inverse of the kinetic terms in this free Lagrangian here. So that tells us something about the Feynman diagrams. Right? Because what does that literally mean? What it literally means is that here you have some special vertex in your Feynman diagram, so you do weak contractions and everything, then this becomes like a new Feynman rule for some strange vertex. And this strange vertex has Feynman rules which come from the free part of the Lagrangian, but the free part of the Lagrangian is the inverse of a propagator. That means once this vertex uh, is connected to some propagator in the Feynman diagram, there will be some cancellation. This vertex will cancel some propagator because it's the inverse. So that vertex times the next propagator next to it will uh, be um, simplified. That is what we need to figure out exactly. Okay? So evaluate this. So in order to evaluate it, we need to now look in more detail at this free part. Yes. So, and by the way, I often or almost always forget to write the integrals because it's uh, like a summation index. If you have such an expression in functional language where there is an open space-time argument, then it's automatically integrated over. That's why I always forget to write these integrals. But here, this is, this is the correct place for the integrals, and the integral corresponds to this argument of those two objects here, also here. Now, the free action is uh, given over there at the top, one half phi k phi. So if you take the variation, then the one half cancels, and uh, you get simply delta phi i k i j phi j. And of course, this is still a little bit special notation adapted to scalar fields, but it's clear that you can do the absolutely same thing for a spin of fields and vector fields and so on. You just have always some differential operator and uh, if there is a symmetry factor, then it cancels. If there is no symmetry factor, then uh, you have appropriate terms. So this is completely general. So you have now this variation expanded. There is our famous differential operator. Here there is a normal elementary field, and here there is the composite operator corresponding to our field transformation. Okay, and this uh, corresponds to the square bracket here. And as I said, this is a special vertex. It's a special vertex, maybe a non-trivial vertex, because this delta phi might be non-linear. Maybe this contains phi cube. Then this would be overall phi to the four or something like that. Anyway, that is what we have here. And now we need to do weak contractions. So let's say again, to be becomes 
1 over n factorial. Let's highlight here one particular phi m. And then we have this special insertion, i times integral delta phi k phi. Let's use index free notation. Then um, all these factors Okay, that is what we have. And now let's do weak contractions. Let's do it in some color. And let us pick this particular field here, this phi. And let us ask, what can it be contracted with? Eventually, in, if we evaluate Wick's theorem, this is one of the many fields in this expression, and for sure it must be contracted with something else. And now we can evaluate precisely the contractions of this particular phi, and then see what happens. Then, of course, everything else gets also contracted, but we can care about that later. Also here, we have not yet specified any contractions. So let's only look at this. What can this be contracted with? I see here several possibilities. Let's start from the closest one. One possibility is that this phi is contracted with some field operator inside of the delta phi. This is one first possibility. So this is some object. We don't know what it is, but it uh, is some functional of fields or some local product of fields. It could contain phi alone. It could contain phi square or it could contain phi cube or something like that. But anyway, it can contain fields and then we can contract, we can contract this field with one of the field operators inside of that. So the first possibility. the first possibility. Then next, of course, may be more obvious, you can contract this field operator with any of them here at the beginning. And let's uh, contract it with this singled out phi m here, which stands for any of the fields phi 1 up to phi n. So this is the second possibility that can happen. And then, of course, the third possibility is that you contract this field phi with any of the fields inside of any of these factors of S int. So let's do it uh, with the first one. And then this is, of course, a complicated functional of all fields of the theory. Um, but most likely, there will be some fields inside of it which can be contracted with that particular field. And then this gives rise to a propagator. So that is the third possibility. So each possibility gives rise to a certain class of Feynman diagrams. The first class of Feynman diagrams is a diagram where you have here this special vertex. So all of this is at one particular vertex at some particular space-time position x. And uh, this field is connected to the vertex. That field is also connected to the vertex. So here you have a propagator which begins and ends at the same vertex. So it's like a tadpole loop. Here, you have all the external fields of your diagram. These are the external fields. And uh, so this is a case where one of the external fields directly connects to our special vertex. So it connects to the special vertex via this factor phi. And then uh, the special vertex contains other fields which give rise to lines, which are somehow complicated lines inside the Feynman diagram. And the third kind of Feynman diagram is where uh, our special vertex is connected to another normal vertex of our theory. So these are the normal vertices of our theory. And here the special vertex is connected by one propagator to another normal vertex. Okay, so these are the three cases. 
And now each of these cases needs to be evaluated. Maybe we can do this directly on the right here. Case one. What happens in case one? In case one, we have this special vertex here. Special vertex. Uh, maybe let's denote the special vertex with a square. Then this is our special vertex at position x. Therefore, let me give here an x argument to this. This is all depending on x. So here is x. Then this special vertex contains maybe many fields in this delta phi, which are connected to the rest of the Feynman diagram. We don't know anything about this, but here there is our one phi line, and this is now contracted with one other line inside of this delta phi operator. So this is how the diagram looks like. This is this special wick contraction. And what is the Feynman rule for this? The Feynman rule is now an extremely complicated factor which we know nothing about, but then we have here one knowledge, namely our special vertex contains k, so it's proportional to k, of course in momentum space, and then it contains a propagator of phi to phi m. D and okay, um, now the index free notation is kind of pointless. Let me say phi i, phi k i j, phi j. Then here we have our phi j. This is contracted with some phi k inside of this. And then here we have k i j, d j k, also in momentum space. And that is of course integrated over and so, as you see, this is one single loop diagram. Nothing in between, it's just a one loop diagram. And what is the integrand? The integrand of this one loop diagram, where momentum k is flowing through the loop, the integrand is just a Kronecker delta, delta i k. Uh, that is not good. So let's call the loop momentum q. So we have here a loop integral over this loop momentum Q, which flows through the propagator. And the loop integrand is just a Kronecker delta, 0 or 1. Because the propagator has been canceled by the Feynman rule. So lo and behold, everything I said before, long uh, story short, the vertex contains the inverse of the propagator. Therefore, the vertex cancels the propagator. And therefore, the loop integrand is just a constant. And in dimensional regularization, an integral over a constant vanishes. And also, by the way, in um, our graph theory approach and python lona meison tadpole diagrams are completely ignored anyway. This is a tadpole diagram, so one could also say we ignore it. But if, even if we don't ignore it, it's a loop integral over a constant, independent of the momentum. Therefore, the integral is zero in dimensional regularization. Therefore, this first kind of trivial contraction gives zero. So let us do the second case, the second big contraction. How does the second big contraction look like in terms of Feynman diagrams? So we have now a contraction between an external phi m and our special vertex. So let's say our Feynman diagram contains here the external field phi m. Here is our special vertex, and they are connected by one propagator. Then just to say in addition, the Feynman diagram contains many normal vertices from those factors of the interaction Lagrangian and it contains some extra external fields, phi 1, phi 2, and so on. And they are connected to some vertices. The vertices might be connected with some lines, and also our special vertex might be connected somehow to all these internal vertices. So this is how the Feynman diagram looks like. But what we know and what we care about is the red part. 
which is this single contraction between our spatial vertex and the field phi m. What is the result of this red part of the diagram, which consists of the square bracket contracted with phi m? So phi m contracted with a square bracket, i times delta phi i k phi j phi j. But everything in momentum space, which I just indicate by a tilde for a Fourier transformation, and then this is contracted by a weak contraction. So in Fourier space, this integral over space time goes away because the vertex position is integrated over and instead we have momentum conservation. And then we have here the following, i times delta phi i k i j in momentum space, and then the propagator phi j phi m, also in momentum space. Now this propagator is given by i times our d j m in momentum space, and then we have again this cancellation. The Feynman rule k tilde cancels the propagator. So this vertex here contains a part, momentum dependent part, which is exactly uh, canceling this propagator here. Okay, and what remains is i times another i. This gives a Kronecker delta. The Kronecker delta is delta of i and m. Contracted with this is overall minus delta phi m. That's all. That is the result of the contraction of the red line here with our special vertex. And now we can compare this result to our line one. Here, all the red stuff is now replaced by minus delta phi m. And if you compare it, then all the rest is equal to the line one. Here we have the same number of factors, which uh, we have not done anything with. Here we have now minus delta phi m instead of plus delta phi m, and all the other external fields are the same. And also the n factorial is the same. Therefore, this precisely cancels line one. This is very nice. And that already means we have achieved two out of three steps. Namely, the first contraction gives zero on its own. The second contraction cancels line one. And now, hopefully, the third contraction will cancel uh, this line 2a. So that is what we need to do next. So this is our weak contraction three, um, which diagrammatically might be written as follows. So here we have our special vertex. And then we have all the other internal normal vertices. And our special vertex is now contracted with one of the normal internal vertices. And then of course there are external fields, phi one, phi n, we don't know what they are contracted with. Um, they might still also be contracted with the special vertex. That is not forbidden because there are also contractions between this and some delta phi. We don't care about this, but uh, that is allowed. Um, but some other external fields might also be contracted with the internal vertices. But anyway, then there are many internal lines and external lines and so on. But we only care about one thing. Namely, we care about this particular red propagator, which connects one internal vertex with our special vertex. And then again, the special vertex should somehow cancel this propagator, and that gives rise to a simplification. So how does it work exactly in this case? So first, um, we now have many identical versions of this S int. Therefore, we first of all get a factor n because there are n identical factors. 
So this is a normal symmetry factor, which we can take into account here. And this factor n cancels the 1 over n factorial and makes out of it a 1 over n minus 1 factorial, like we already have in our line 2a. That is already nice. So we get a factor n. And then let us look at one particular contraction, i times um, delta phi i k i j phi j, and then i times s int. And this is now contracted. So what does that give? So what it essentially does is the following. We have here the factor i remains, and then in momentum space, of course, again, the integral goes away. We have delta phi i k i j. And now what we need to do is we have to pick out one field operator out of this interaction vertex or expression, which means we can write it in the following way. We have here our explicit field phi j, and then out of this we extract somehow a field operator phi k, and uh, this extraction means that we take the functional derivative of this as int with respect to phi k, which means that we uh, pick out the field, get the appropriate symmetry factor, and then we have here a remaining a factor from the remaining field operators in this expression. But this is singled out and contracted with our field phi j. This is what we really have. The bracket is not really necessary anymore. And so again, what we get is uh, i times delta phi. And that, of course, again, gives a Kronecker delta. This uh, cancels the propagator. And what simply remains is minus delta phi k from all of these contractions times the functional derivative with respect to phi k. And now let's compare it to our expression in line 2a. It should be the same. Uh, aha. Mm, what about the factor i? I hope I didn't mess up the factor of i. But anyway, uh, it looks very good because this expression here is already the same as what we have here. Of course, the factor n factorial has already worked out. Then there are n minus 1 remaining factors of the interaction Lagrangian. And the 1 factor has been um, rearranged into this form. Ah, I forgot this i. So uh, exactly, so that's the point. So we have here this explicit i. Then from here we get a second i because of this contraction. This i and that i together gives the minus 1, but this final i remains. And so we have here this additional factor of i, which we also have in line 2a. And therefore, this precisely cancels to a and then our proof is complete. We have completely established the quantum action principle in the context of dimensional regularization and dimensional reduction. And uh, there were two properties actually necessary. One property was what I highlighted in the beginning, namely also in d dimensions, there is a relationship between the free Lagrangian and the propagators. The propagators which we use in the regularized Feynman diagrams are the inverse of the d-dimensional kinetic terms. That is important, and we have used it over and over again. The second property, which I didn't highlight before, um, was that integrals over constants in dimensional regularization vanish. Or in brighton lohner meison we ignore tet pole graphs by definition. But either way, um, in this way, this uh, first simple contraction drops out as well, and then we have this cancellation. So lo and behold, the property is established, and as I said, um, we approved in this way this most general quantum action principle, 
from which the other ones can be derived as special cases. But um, you could also do the direct proof for all the special cases in a similar way. You now see how it works. It's really a diagrammatic proof. And um, each proof of all these different theorems will involve this cancellation between terms coming from the interaction Lagrangian and terms coming from the free Lagrangian. This is really the only difficulty in the proof. Everything else is kind of obvious. So in that sense, uh, we see here now that the path integral derivation was very slick and elegant, but it was based on an undefined path integral measure. Here we have a diagrammatic proof, and the diagrammatic proof is, after all, also not very complicated. It's diagrammatic, and it works quite smoothly as well. Therefore, it is not really so much more difficult to prove it in this way than in the path integral formalism. But you see that all these steps would not be true in any regularization renormalization scheme, because you might invent regularizations where some of these items, like this uh, cancellation or that cancellation, might not be true. And therefore, it is not guaranteed that in all regularization schemes, you have this quantum action principle, where you can relate those green function properties to properties of your defining Lagrangian of the theory. That is an important um, thing to keep in mind. So in that sense, dimensional regularization and dimensional reduction are nicer than, let's say, your average or generic regularization and renormalization schemes, because already on the regularized level, you have this property. And that gives rise to very specific information on the scheme. So this is quite beautiful. And let me now okay, clean the blackboard. And then we um, derive some consequences, which are very nice and satisfactory. And then we stop for today. Let us now use what we have derived to ask a very interesting question. Namely, does dimensional regularization preserve certain symmetries such as gauge invariance? We have seen at the beginning of today in the path integral formalism that Ward identities and Slavnov-Taylor identities represent symmetries on the level of green functions. We have derived those Ward identities in various forms using uh, the Z functional or the gamma functional. And they look differently whether we have linear symmetries or nonlinear symmetries. But anyway, these identities reflect symmetries at the level of green functions. On the other hand, we have now proven the quantum action principle holds exactly in dimensional regularization. And the Ward identities are somehow a corollary of this quantum action principle in the general case. Now, let us ask, is a Ward identity valid in the dimensions in the uh, context of dimensional regularization or dimensional reduction? That can now be answered very cleverly using the quantum action principle. So the question is, first of all, we take a symmetry. phi i goes to phi i plus delta phi i in the usual sense where this could be a composite operator, either linear or nonlinear. And the three level action should be invariant. So in, yeah, let's say um, L or the action is classical, goes under the symmetry transformation to itself as classical, which means that this variation this would be the variation, and this is zero. So this is the condition. 
So we have a symmetry on the level of the classical theory. That is our starting point. And then the question is, uh, do the symmetries hold on the level of green functions? And for us now, the simplest way to write it down is again on the level of full green functions without gamma, but just on the same level as we have just done it for dimensional regularization, where we have zero is equal to, in quotation marks, this delta of phi one to phi n, where this quotation mark expression is really uh, defined by a product rule, so it's this delta phi 1 up to phi n plus and so on plus phi 1 up to delta phi n. We are always, we have the sources, j and y, whatever. They can still be switched on, but they can also be switched off. Anyway, for all these green functions, we have this identity that would correspond to the symmetry and now the question is, is this identity valid or not? Now, in the path integral, we have simply assumed the measure is invariant. And then we have derived that this is true. Now, in dimensional regularization, we know precisely the quantum action principle is valid. And it is valid in the sense that we need to plug in our regularized Lagrangian, including counter terms, including d-dimensional objects, into all those expressions. Therefore, now this uh, becomes a non-trivial question. Could be yes or no. And So um, uh, what does it depend on? In dimensional regularization and in dimensional reduction, we now know for sure the following thing. Namely, we know the quantum action principle. And in the sense that we have now, um, it is literally this very same expression. But then there is the additional term, namely the term coming from the variation of the d-dimensional action, which is this i times derivative of S full um, derivative with respect to phi i times delta phi i. So this is what we have just proven. And uh, in the proof, we split this into the free part and the capital I and T part. But now uh, we are back to the original statement where we have just the full action. And the point was that this is really the bare action in d dimensions. Therefore, now the answer could be no, because even though the classical action is invariant under the symmetry, the d-dimensional bare action might not be. If it is not zero, uh, then this square bracket is not vanishing, and therefore uh, the um, some of those green functions up to here, they might not vanish, uh, but instead they add up to this expression here, which is a non-zero expression. On the other hand, if our d-dimensional bear action is also invariant under the symmetry, then it follows that uh, this term here is zero, and then on the regularized level, our ward and slavnov taylor identity is valid. So we have an extremely simple and powerful criterion as to whether the Slavnov-Taylor identities are valid. Namely, 
if the d-dimensional Bayer action is invariant under the symmetry, then the wadden slavnov taylor identities are valid at all orders on the regularized level in those schemes, and otherwise not. Let's write it down. So the answer is, if this bare action in the dimensions or otherwise known as, uh, as full is invariant under the same symmetry, then the Watt identity and slavnov taylor identity is valid at all orders in dimensional regularization. Very good. How is this in the path integral? In the path integral, we made this assumption that the measure is invariant, and now we see what that really means. If you say the path integral is actually defined via dimensional regularization, then the question whether the measure is invariant or not is equivalent to the question whether you can extend the classical action to a d-dimensional bare action without breaking the symmetries. That really corresponds exactly to the path integral measure. If you can extend the classical action to the dimensions and keep the symmetries, then effectively the measure is invariant. In the other case, it's effectively not invariant. So and this can, of course, be checked very easily. You can write down the d-dimensional bare action or the d-dimensional action without counter terms, and then you know immediately uh, whether or not the water identities are valid. Actually, of course, in the opposite case, where this thing here is not invariant, um, the square bracket is non-zero. But accidentally, maybe the expectation value here is still zero. Then still the water identities are valid. But um, at least if you have here a non-vanishing square bracket, most likely, eventually, you will be able to write down some very high order green functions which are non-zero, and then you would say that the water and slavnov taylor identities are not valid at all orders. But they might be valid at some low orders where the insertion of this non-zero square bracket somehow vanishes. Luckily, that happens also in practice. So and now, since this lecture here is not really focusing on symmetries as such, let me just give you some examples without explaining too many details. And uh, the first example is QED. The QED Lagrangian in four dimensions looks like this, psi bar, gamma mu, covariate, uh, I times d mu minus m psi minus 1 over 4 f mu nu f mu nu and the gauge transformations are psi going to e to the i alpha times psi in an x-dependent way and the photon field a mu of x goes to a mu of x um, plus a constant times d mu of alpha of x. So the constant is um, 1 over the charge uh, with plus or minus prefactor, which I don't care about right now. OK, and so uh, this is the gauge transformation. And the Lagrangian is invariant under this. And it is invariant in a trivial way for this term and for a, an almost trivial way for the mass term. And it's invariant in a non-trivial way for the interaction term with the covariant derivative. But nevertheless, all of these transformations are completely independent of the dimensionality. So if you go to d-dimensions, then 
uh, the Lagrangian in d dimensions where this is now a d dimensional derivative. This might be a d dimensional gamma matrix, and uh, all of these Lorentz indices are also d dimensional. That is still gauge invariant under exactly the same transformation. And therefore, this statement can be applied. So for QED, gauge invariance does not only hold on the classical level in four dimensions, it also holds on the d-dimensional level, and therefore the slavnov taylor and Watt identities of QED corresponding to this gauge invariance, they are valid identically at all orders immediately. You don't have to check anything else, you know that dimensional regularization preserves QED gauge invariance in this sense. Dimensional reduction would have here, um, let's say, a DS for the photon field, but that doesn't change it. It is still gauge invariant also in dimensional reduction. So that means that uh, in both schemes, the regularized screen functions satisfy the Watt and slavnov taylor identities, and then uh, the logic is that you prove this first without counter terms, then you know uh, on the regularized level where you have divergences, the identities are valid. Therefore, the only counter terms you need to cancel divergences are also gauge invariant counter terms, and then you add those gauge invariant counter terms, and you can apply again the same statement to the renormalized theory after adding counter terms, and then even in the renormalized QED uh, with counter terms. Also, the Water and slavnov taylor identities are valid. So this is very simple and extremely elegant, and this is one of the key advantages of dimensional regularization. Just uh, let me mention, without going into details, as I said, uh, really, gauge invariance is replaced by BRS or BRST invariance in a full treatment of uh, renormalization of QED, but uh, that doesn't change the argument. Only that you heard the name so that you don't get confused. And in QCD, it's actually the same. So in QCD, the Lagrangian has exactly the same form, except that the symbols mean different things because you have gluon field strength uh, tensors which uh, have a color index, and the quarks here have color indices, and so on and so forth. But anyway, uh, still the gauge transformation has no d-dependence, and uh, the gauge transformations cancel between all the objects. And therefore, also the Watt and slavnov taylor identities of QCD hold on the regularized level with divergences. So you only need gauge invariant and BRS invariant counter terms to cancel the divergences. So after you added the counter terms, you can apply the same logic to the counter term Lagrangian. And also then you have renormalized Watt and slavnov taylor identities, which are automatically valid at all orders in both dimensional regularization and dimensional reduction. That is extremely beautiful. And now the gamma 5 problem. Let's start again. In QED and QCD, dimensional reduction is, uh, and uh, dimensional regularization is perfect because it preserves gauge invariance manifestly. But let us now look at the electroweak standard model where there is the gamma 5 problem. The point of the electroweak standard model is that it is what is called a chiral gauge theory. The hallmark of a chiral gauge theory is that the gauge transformations of a spin or phi psi uh, are different for the left-handed and the right-handed parts. So here we might have e to the i alpha times the left-handed part plus e to the i beta times the right-handed part of the spin or such different gauge transformations for the left and right-handed part are the definition of a chiral gauge theory. So chiral fermions are left or right-handed fermions. These are chirality eigenstates. And these are just generically two different gauge transformations. In the concrete electroweak standard model, only the left-handed part has SU2 gauge transformations. 
the right-handed parts have no AC2 gauge transformations, and so on. Also, the hypercharges are different. But anyway, this is the general definition of a chiral gauge theory. And now let us write down generically also the Lagrangian of such a chiral gauge theory like the electroweak standard model. But let's not write the exact electroweak standard model, but just a simplified notation. Let's say psi bar gamma mu uh, times a covariant derivative times psi. And then because of this chiral nature of the gauge theory, also the left-handed parts and the right-handed parts of the fermions have different covariant derivatives and different interactions. And so already in four dimensions, you need to have one term where you have here P right, let's say, and then another term where you would have P left instead of P right at this place. And for us, let us now ignore uh, the second part. Let's only look at the first part because each part is gauge invariant on its own in four dimensions, that is. And uh, therefore, let us see what happens to such a term if we go to D dimensions. So if we go to D dimensions, then the point is that this P right projection operator on the chirality eigenstate is now one half times the unit matrix plus gamma five. And in this consistent version of gamma five, this uh, toft feldman breiten lohner meisson scheme, gamma five does not anti-commute with the d-dimensional gamma matrices. But remember, we must put here d-dimensional gamma matrices because of this uh, propagator, which needs to be the inverse of this kinetic term. So it all uh, belongs, or uh, it is all connected. Okay, so let us now look at the gauge transformation of this. So the gauge transformation of this is as follows, so psi bar. And let's also only look at the alpha part of the gauge transformation because alpha and beta are anyway independent. So let's say beta uh, goes to zero and we just ignore this term. We only take the alpha term. And then this goes to psi bar uh, and the bar version gives here a p right times e to the minus i alpha. Then we have the d-dimensional um, gamma matrix. And now the d-dimensional covariant derivative, this uh, remains behaving in a covariant way. So overall, for this product, this behaves like the spinor itself. So um, we get a factor e to the i alpha times p left. That's what we get. Okay, and now this does not cancel, right? It does not cancel, or at least it uh, doesn't give the same as what we had originally. So originally, this is what we started with, and uh, this is what we end up with. So what is this? Um, let's say the e to the i alpha, that does cancel, however, what remains is psi bar p right times a d-dimensional gamma mu matrix times p left times d mu in d dimensions times psi. And then this does not anti-commute. In four dimensions, we could anti-commute it, and out of the P left here, we would get a P right there, connected with P right over there, and then we have the same as what we started with. But now we do not get the same thing back. Instead, we obtain some additional term. So precisely, we need to evaluate this object, and the object is gamma mu, I remove the index, but uh, or let's keep it gamma mu in d dimensions times one half minus uh, gamma mu in d dimensions times one half gamma five, which is the same as um, one half gamma mu in d dimensions plus one half gamma five gamma mu in d dimensions, so here I have used the anti-commutator of gamma mu and gamma five, and then we need to subtract two times in the end once 
gamma 5 and the commutator between gamma mu and d. And the point is that this is not zero. So what we get here is psi bar p right gamma mu in d dimensions times d mu in d dimensions times psi plus this anti-commutator term minus psi bar p right uh, times the anti-commutator of gamma 5 comma gamma mu in d dimensions times this times psi. So it's not gauge invariant because uh, after a gauge transformation we get the original Lagrangian plus an extra term and the extra term is evanescent in the sense we have defined it before because this is an object which vanishes in four dimensions. However, in d dimensions it does not vanish because this anti-commutator is now not zero. So effectively it's proportional to epsilon dimensions but anyway it's not zero. And this is an example where a d-dimensional regularized Lagrangian is not invariant under the original symmetry and therefore going back to the original argument it would tell you that the warden slavnov taylor identities of the electroweak standard model are not manifestly preserved in dimensional regularization or dimensional reduction. They are violated because of this gamma 5 problem. And uh, if, however, you would ignore the gamma 5 problem and simply say gamma 5 is anti-commuting, then this is not true, then you have manifest gauge invariance. And uh, so this is a big problem and a current research topic of several groups, including our group. And as I already announced in the literature, there are many different approaches to it. The rigorous approach is to use this non-anti-commuting gamma-5 scheme and then you have to accept that gauge invariance is lost in intermediate steps. And you need to be extra careful in order to arrange that after renormalization, gauge invariance is restored. So you need symmetry restoring counterterms. On the other hand, uh, many people um, ignore the gamma-5 problem uh, also we, uh, if, if possible, we ignore the gamma 5 problem, so it's not a bad thing to do that if you know what you are doing. Because in many cases, this non-anti-commuting gamma 5 um, is not necessary because if you just assume um, the normal anti-commuting gamma 5, let's say a naive approach to gamma 5 in d dimensions, then you do not run into conflict. You do not uh, generate any inconsistencies like with traces of gamma 5, because in many cases, in many calculations, there are no traces of gamma 5. And so because of this, often you can ignore this problem and you can just calculate with an anti-commuting gamma 5. But eventually, rigorously, you cannot ignore it and therefore, in the electroweak theory, the Ward and slavnov taylor identities are not manifestly preserved. And now just a final comment. The final comment is on supersymmetry. Supersymmetry, you can do the same analysis also for supersymmetry and then you will see in dimensional regularization, you have a mismatch of degrees of freedom as I already mentioned, but now you see what it technically implies. The mismatch of degrees of freedom between the photon field, which has, let's say, D components versus a gauge spinor, spinor, which is a spinor and uh, the trace of one in spinor space is always four, so effectively this has always four degrees of freedom. So there is a mismatch. And that means if you just look at the regularized Lagrangian in dimensional regularization of some supersymmetric theory which involves gauge bosons, then this is not supersymmetric anymore. So let's say a variation or an infinitesimal SUSY transformation applied onto this does not give zero. Instead, it gives some evanescent terms just like we just encountered for gamma 5 problem. 
So the same thing happens, and that tells you that uh, Ward and Slavnov Taylor identities for supersymmetry are not valid in dimensional regularization. And actually, this problem uh, you saw in the exercise is already relevant at the one-loop level in very, very simple cases. For example, supersymmetric QED, the mass corrections to the electron and the electron mass, they should be the same because the masses must be the same in a SUSY theory, but they are not the same because of this regularization artifact. And this fact was the reason why dimensional reduction was invented. Dimensional reduction was invented by Warren Siegel. He knew that and he invented the scheme to solve this problem. And so dimensional reduction wants to treat uh, photons in four dimensions so that the number of degrees of freedom is the same. However, now, uh, as I explained the last time, in dimensional reduction, there are a lot of subtleties. And in particular, you cannot assume that the photon field is living in strictly four dimensions where you can do index counting, but it lives in a quasi four dimensional space, which is a bigger space than the quasi d dimensional space. Okay. Still, the number of degrees of freedom matches, which is good, a big advantage of the scheme. However, you still cannot do index counting if you are really serious. And uh, for this reason, fields identities are not valid. In, uh, on the regularized level, they are also not valid in dimensional re regularization, but here this is only a secondary problem. The primary problem there is this one. This problem is now solved, but what remains is this uh, subtle, more subtle problem of fields identities not being valid. Because fields identities rely on index counting and on strictly four dimensions, so they are not valid. And because of this, even in dimensional re reduction, the regularized Lagrangian of a supersymmetric theory is not supersymmetric. However, this problem, like the gamma 5 problem, can be ignored to some extent. Actually, here, uh, ignoring it is even easier than in gamma 5, because here you do not have to do some subtle tricks. I mean, it's just um, the fields identities are not valid, but uh, you just do not have to apply fields identities whatsoever in your calculation. And therefore, uh, many calculations are completely blind to this. And what that technically means is literally this. The quantum action principle tells you this identity here at the bottom of the page. So what you need to calculate, or what governs your slavnov taylor and Watt identities, is the insertion of this variation into green functions. Now, the variation comes from here. So the variation of a Lagrangian in the dimensions, in dimensional reduction, is not zero because of fields identities. So what this gives you is a certain expression. You can calculate it. You can find it, for example, in my paper that I mentioned before, in the context of the quantum action principle. There you find the explicit expression for that. It's an operator, and you can compute green functions of this operator. And extremely many of these green functions are actually zero. You need to work a lot and go to very, very high orders in perturbation theory until you find non-zero green functions. And that is why dimensional reduction is really supersymmetric to a very large extent in um, one loop, two loop, even three loop calculations. Uh, you see that supersymmetry identities are actually valid. So let's put it like this, insertions of this delta Susi of L are often zero. And uh, that is why you can say dimensional reduction preserves Susi to a large extent. And the most recent study of that kind was in a paper by us here, 
with a master student, Joshua Unger, from 2018. And there we checked such identities at the three loop level and showed that in very relevant cases, supersymmetry is preserved. In spite of this uh, being non-zero, which means that ultimately in all orders, supersymmetry is not preserved. Okay, so this gives you an outlook to some interesting current uh, research projects in the context of regularization and renormalization schemes. The general message is that the quantum action principle is a very basic relationship between green functions at all orders and variations of the uh, defining Lagrangian of your theory. And the quantum action principle can be very easily derived in the path integral, but it's literally true in dimensional regularization and dimensional reduction. It can be used to prove very powerful, very useful and important properties like manifest gauge invariance of QED and QCD. Also, uh, almost manifest gauge invariance in the electroweak theory if you ignore gamma 5. But if you don't ignore gamma 5, then the electroweak theory does not manifestly preserve gauge invariance. In the case of supersymmetry, dimensional regularization directly breaks it. And you can see this also in this way. Dimensional reduction eventually also breaks supersymmetry, and you can also see it in this way, but uh, you can also check in this way that actually, uh, to a large extent, um, supersymmetry is preserved in many practical calculations. Since I mentioned here the gamma 5 problem and the electroweak theory, let me also point out to uh, you, since you are studying here in Dresden, um, let me point out that there is a collaboration going on between us here and the Croatian group, which you also know from the exercises. So, and from us, you can also find a recent paper on the gamma 5 treatment in the Toft Feldman Brighton Lona Meison scheme from 2020, where we discussed it exactly using this setup that we discussed today in the lecture, with the goal to define these uh, symmetry restoring counterterms that I mentioned which become necessary if gauge invariance is broken in intermediate steps. And in that paper, you see all the formalism explained in very, very great detail with all the intermediate steps on gauge transformations, the classical action in four dimensions, in D dimensions, and uh, the determination of divergent counterterms, of divergencies of green functions, and finally, of the symmetry um, breaking which is determined precisely in this way. And then you find the determination of the symmetry restoring counterterms, which are necessary in order to cancel this effect. So this gives you an additional background information and also an outlook on what remains to be done in the future, which is namely to extend this approach to, for example, higher orders or more general theories. Okay, that ends the lecture here. Thank you very much for this and uh, see you next week.